it to this uh, second uh, afternoon session, afternoon for European uh, time. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Luciano Rezzolla, which uh, will talk about imaging a supermassive black hole. Thank you, Luciano. Okay, so um, first of all, I should thank the organizers for the kind invitation and for setting up such a fantastic meeting. Um, I really wish um, this was done in person so that we had more time to, to discuss um, because there is so much overlap uh, among the things we're doing when, in terms of black holes that, you know, being in person is the, really the right way of handling all of this. But that being um, said, let me just tell you a little bit about imaging a supermassive black hole. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what is it that this is what I would like to talk to you about. First of all, how do you actually do this from an observation point of view? This is something that you know I first didn't know myself, I had to learn. And then I'll tell you about how you image from a theoretical point of view. And an and important step, uh, some of, in, which has also some philosophical aspects to it, is comparing theory and observations. And I will then end with some alternatives to Einstein and to black holes. Okay, so imaging a supermassive black hole um, immediately brings you to a very basic problem. And, and that is that black holes are the most compact objects in nature. You simply cannot confine mass or energy into a smaller volume. Given that, um, we're lucky that black holes are astronomical objects um, in the sense that we don't have them on our planet. On the other hand, uh, we are unlucky because they are at astronomical distances. And if you want to image, so you want to see something, um, then you will need a black hole that has to have a projected size on the sky that is resolvable, something you can actually see with a, with a telescope. And, you know, this is a very simple um, basic problem that has prevented us from doing an image of a, of a, of a supermassive black hole or of a black hole for, um, for so many years. And your best chance to solve this problem is to have a very massive black hole and have it sufficiently close to us. This is because you easily realize that um, stellar mass black holes will not do it for you. Uh, you simply will never have enough resolution, or at least not, not in my lifetime, to image a stellar mass black hole. So you really need to get something which is large enough so that you have a large enough event horizon on the sky and is not too far away from us because otherwise you don't see it. And when we first started this uh, whole idea, um, we didn't really know whether we would make it or not because all we have is a limit in our resolution. And then whether or not we have a, uh, a black hole which has the right size to be imaged, that was an open question. So um, our best guess was M87. This is an elliptical galaxy in the center of the Virgo cluster. Um, we already knew that there was you know, a large mass at the center, something of the order of, of, of a few billion solar masses, which made it an, an interesting target because of the reason I was just mentioning. This is what you look at it um, as you look at it in, in the optical. And you can see there is a little filament over here that um, actually was Mis mistaken for a um, the tail of a comet. So for many years, well, I mean, we're talking about last century or so, uh, people thought this was a comet at the beginning. But now we know this is an, a jet, an ultra relativistic jet of, of plasma. If you look at it in the radio, the whole thing becomes much bigger. And that's because there are lots of very highly energetic electrons emitting light in the radio. And this is a radio map in a few centimeter wavelength. Um, Radio observations are very powerful and they, they allow you to have a technique, which I will explain uh, better later on, that uh, essentially allows you to zoom in wherever you want. So take that you want to look at the, you know, the core, what well, is not really the core, but the whole galaxy scale, then you can simply do, do, do this using this technique. And so you can, you can zoom in on what is this jet, uh, which is emitting radio emission. And you can do better. You can zoom in right at the, you know, the, uh, the central part of the jet, and you can start seeing, you know, motion of matter over many years. You can even zoom in further over here, and you can see these these spots. We now know quite a lot uh, about the properties of these spots, but really the challenge was to get a resolution of this type here. So that's the kind of resolution we wanted. It was considerably better than anything uh, was ever done before with the LBI. So DLBI, what is this? This is uh, a technique which is essentially interferometry. So once again, 
all of our science and progress in astrophysics come from interferometry. And you can sum up uh, the basic functioning of the LBI in this very simple expression, which actually works not only for radio, but for any electromagnetic wave uh, you are collecting. If you want to have a certain resolution, which is a number, essentially you want to have as small as possible, then you have to decide uh, between a wavelength at which you are collecting light and the size of a telescope which you are collecting this light. The smaller this number, the better or higher the resolution you have. So what wavelength? You may think, well, let's go for the shortest wavelength possible uh, so I can get a very small number there. But that, that's very naive. Um, most of the light that is emitted near a black hole, a particular supermassive black hole, doesn't get to us because it's trapped, scattered. So we will never be able to do imaging uh, in, in, in gamma rays, for instance. So what you're left with is those wavelengths that are sufficiently um, transparent, uh, for which the medium between us and the source is sufficient transparent that we can actually receive them. And so we're talking about radio waves. And in this case, you try to go to the smallest possible wavelength. Um, in the case of EHT, we have performed uh, observation in 1.3 millimeter. And then you ask yourself, okay, I want a, a large telescope. Um, you know, radio telescope can be quite large. Uh, fast in, in China is 500 meter. Um, diameter, so half a kilometer of diameter, but that still would not be enough to reach the few tens of a micro arc second that we need. So the idea is to use actually intercontinental distance, the largest possible telescope we can build. And, um, and of course you can't build it physically, but you can create a virtual telescope. This is what uh, the HD essentially done. So you take telescope, small telescope, few tens of meters uh, in diameter uh, across across um, Europe and US and uh, South America. And then you put them together and in such a way that they would function just as if it was a single telescope. So you can connect Arizona with Hawaii and have a single telescope, which is as big now as the distance between um, Arizona and Hawaii, which is about a few thousand kilometers. And uh, and if you think a little bit about this, this you know sounds a bit uh, fishy. The reason why you can actually do this is because you have to make sure that you are capturing exactly the same electromagnetic wavefront. And you do this by recording not only the electric field that, that, that arrives to you, but also the time at which it arrives to you. And when you do this, then you can align the signal and do proper interferometry. So in, uh, really do a linear superposition of the, of, of the different wavefronts. And having more telescopes is, is helpful for a number of reasons. The first one is that as you, you know, from the, the very simple formula below, different baselines, that is different separation between uh, telescopes will give you different resolution. So you have an image, not just a single re uh, resolution, but you have a different resolution. In addition, because the planet is actually rotating, this means that if you were just having these two guys, at one point, these two guys would stop seeing the source and uh, you, you wouldn't have enough information to actually do an imaging. So you would like to have uh, a continuous operation. And for this, uh, having telescopes that can replace uh, those who have been eclipsed by the rotation is very, very convenient. And so we have a telescope, as I said, in Europe, we don't have any telescope in, 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 uh, you know, in, in, in the Far East, and that's unfortunate, but these are sufficient to give us about eight hours of observations that we need. Now, um, I've explained you have a, a network of telescope, each telescope has a baseline, this baseline is changing in time, and in doing this, you are populating the UV uh, plane. Um, through these tracks whose size is given and, 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 and encoded by this color. The UV plane has to be thought as a Fourier transform uh, in two dimensions, where you are not, where you are essentially Fourier transforming the intensity of the light and you're, um, you're not transforming a, a time, um, but you're actually transforming an intensity, which is a function of space. And once you have certain tracks, you can build an image, okay? And if you can populate this space more and more, in principle, if you had perfectly populated, then you have a perfect image. What happens is that you know you tend to populate it for as much as you can, and then you have a, an image which is the best you can produce given the coverage of the UV plane. So this is what 
um, we actually we are we populate this plane, we create tracks uh, in terms of baseline, projected baseline, and as time goes on, we have images we can we can produce. So this is essentially uh, what allows us uh, in 2019 to to present uh, the results of the first black hole imaging. Um, and uh, as you can see, there have, we have four different days. We have been observing for eight days, um, but four were particularly good to be um, publishable. And what you see in this image is essentially what you would expect. Uh, you would expect an image which is not identical across days. There is a variability. You can see that intensity doesn't always map as a peak in the same position. At the same time, you would expect the image to be similar uh, across different days. And that's because the time scale for the change of you know, the mass of M87 are not a few days. So what we get here is coherent and consistent with what we would expect. And this is a time, so this is, you know, this ends the observations. At one point, um, I and co my colleagues were given this image and asked to provide an interpretation, physical interpretation for it. So that's where, you know, we start working. Um, and in order to appreciate what is needed to, to get an interpretation, you have to essentially go through these three steps. The first one is well, it's called generativistic magneto aerodynamic simulations in an arbitrary space time. Essentially, you need to understand what happens to plasma as it is falling onto a black hole from an accretion disk, because that's what we think is happening near a supermassive black hole. Once you know what is the dynamics of this plasma, you need to let it shine. And the light that is produced, you have to trace it so that it reaches an observer. And this is far less obvious uh, than you may think because we are in a curved space time and because light can be absorbed and emitted. Um, and, and as I will explain, we don't know exactly how light actually um, is produced. And then once you have done this and you have hundreds of thousands of possible images, you have to make a comparison between all of this library and the four images that you actually have observed so that you can convince yourself uh, you, you, you've seen something like a supermassive black hole. We have been in the position of doing this because of NERC grant, uh, synergy grant with Ino Falk and Michael Kramer. And essentially we have built a, a whole computational infrastructure to do steps one, two, and three with these three Codes, Bark, Boss, and Gina. And the real heroes of this story are the people that I'm showing here who have been really working hard on, on producing these codes. So let me guide you through these three different steps. The first one is plasma dynamic. I'm showing you what happens if you take a curved black hole, which we represent in curved field coordinates, uh, a rapidly spinning black hole, and you just throw some um, plasma onto it. I'm showing you with orange, red, uh, the rest mass density, and with light, uh, blue and white, the magnetization. Well, density is density. Magnetization is a measure of the strength of the magnetic field. It's the ratio between magnetic energy and rest mass energy. So you can see that in the polar axis, there is a lot of magnetic energy, but very little matter. What you can also appreciate as the, uh, as the uh, simulation restarts is that accretion is not a steady, state uh, process. You have moments where there is a lot of accretion, other where there is less accretion. This is because it's a turbulent process driven by an instability. And so um, you have to appreciate that this will produce intrinsically a variability. This is the inclination at which we think we are looking at M87. So we are almost face on, but not quite. And the jet is, is a bit tilted to the right. And if you now start imagining yourself having uh, radio sensitive eyes, that's what you would see. So this is the radio emission coming from that very accretion flow. It looks like a ring, uh, but actually this is misleading. That's because we are just looking at it in this special inclination. If we now move our camera, you, you would see a very different uh, view. And I will try to explain why it looks like that. And if you now take into account the fact that you have a finite number of telescopes and so a finite resolution, that's what you would expect to see. Something which is a ring with a brighter spot at the bottom 
and a, a, a darker region. And that's what we've seen. So once we have seen this, and the fact that we knew it matched pretty well with what we were expecting, that was already an important confirmation that we were seeing something that looked and behaved like a black hole. But that, of course, doesn't prove that it's a black hole. So now, now that you will, we know what happens to matter, we have to um, understand what happens to light. And this is not trivial. And I'll give you an example. Suppose that you have a black hole and you have a thin disk, which is a very naive uh, visualization and, and uh, idealization. Thin disks do not exist. Uh, but imagine that there is such a disk and it's emitting light and you want to take a photo of this with a given inclination i. Then what you will first see is a direct image, essentially all the light that is coming straight on a straight line to you. And so you will see the front part of the disk. But because you are in a curved space time, you will also see the part behind the black hole. And, and that will show up as this ring over here. And uh, to make things even more interesting, because uh, light can also be uh, bent in this manner, you can actually see also this light over here. So this image that you probably have seen is not coming from my EHD, it's coming from interstellar, shows you what happens um, uh, to light when, um, when in the presence of a black hole. As I said, this is a thin disk and we don't think that, that this is correct. There is also another, you know, imprecision in this in this image, which is uh, uh, on which I will comment on. But the most important approximation is that because of the of the simulation I was showing you, um, accretion onto uh, these supermassive black holes happens in the form of a thick disk, which is just optically thin. And so the image you have to have in your mind is something like so. This is a disk. Uh, emitting light. Uh, it's a static image. I'm just rotating it. So you can appreciate that there is this dark region that can appear or disappear just depending on the angle at which you are looking at it. What is always constant, unless you are really looking at it face on, is that there is always a region which is brighter than the other one. And that's because um, um, there is a Doppler boosting effect that is amplifying the light towards you uh, as, as in contrast to the, the light uh, emitted by plasma that is receding. The light is always going at the same speed, of course. Now, um, what did we have observed and the dark depression in uh, intensity um, is what we call the shadow. What is the shadow? It's got nothing to do with the event horizon. Well, no, nothing to do, it's not right. It's distinct from the event horizon. Um, you can't see the event horizon, by the way. The, the event horizon is a null surface. You can only see, um, you know, mathematically, or if you want, in, in a limit. But what you can see is the shadow. So imagine that you have a black hole and you have a source of light. So you're going to have photons being emitted. And now imagine you are an observer over here. There's going to be photons hitting the event horizon right through that are captured because they are the impact factor is below the event horizon size and these will be captured immediately but are going to be photons um, if there is a photon being which will be uh, inside unstable orbits and so eventually they will be captured so if you are an observer over here there's going to be simply a deficit of light there's going to be less light and elsewhere and this is the shadow um, just to clarify numbers the event horizon is 2m the uh, photon unstable circular orbit is 3m, and the, um, the shadow radius, which is essentially the, the impact parameter at the circular orbit, is square root of 27, so 5.2. So the shadow is far bigger than the horizon. And you can also appreciate an important fact. The shadow doesn't have to be black, because if you are a photon here, if you emit a photon here towards the observer, this photon doesn't have any problem reaching the observer. It's a photon behind here that would have a problem. So that is why you don't expect a perfectly dark region, but a region where you see an intensity suppression. Now, what is the space of parameters? So this is just basic. Uh, picture, um, once you have to produce a lot of images, then you know you have to ask yourself what, what space of parameters do I have to explore. So in GR, you have uh, mass and spin, uh, if you believe in, in, uh, in GR and, and the Mohair theorem. Um, you know, if you have black holes in other theories, then you can start putting in other, other charges or other, other hair. 
And if you are thinking about alternatives to black hole altogether, say compact object with or without a surface, but and without an horizon, then you know you can start uh, opening a zoo of possible objects. Then you have to worry about the plasma dynamics. What I've showed you is consistent but not generic. Um, according to the way the magnetic field uh, regulates the flow, you may have different types of accretion. Um, the most distinct ones, and there are, you know, in between cases, it are same type of accretion or MAD type of accretion. One stands for standard accretion and MAD stands for magnetically arrested disks. So essentially, MAD have a much stronger magnetic field, so strong that actually it can even stop accretion altogether because there is enough ma uh, magnetic flux being advected that this can even stop matter from falling in. And SANI are the most standard uh, accretion of the type I was showing. So the one I showed you is actually the same. And then you have to start worrying about, you know, what happens to light and, uh, and the microphysics of emission. We're pretty certain given the condition that it's synchrotron emission. So light coming from accelerated electrons moving around uh, because of magnetic field lines. But the way this emission is produced, that's, um, you know, a whole, a whole talk on itself. Uh, I'll just mention a few aspects of it. And then, you know, just to, th these are the easiest, uh, the orientation with respect to the observer, which we don't really know, and which uh, force us to consider all sorts of inclinations. So light, uh, I told you that light comes through synchrotron emission because it's coming at, that, at a wavelength where only that can be produced. And then, because you want to get the light from electrons, you need to know the energy of the electron, and in particular, the energy distribution which we have very vague ideas about. Well, you know, if you don't have good ideas, uh, a thermal distribution, a relativistic thermal distribution could be a good idea, but you still don't know what is the temperature um, because the temperature that we calculate in our simulation is the temperature of the more massive part of the flow, so the, the ions. Um, and so what we have is, simulation and give us the temperature of the ions. What we want to know is the temperature of the electrons. How do you go from one to the other? Well, you just say, I have a recipe. And a recipe that um, you know, allows you to, uh, which is sufficiently generic and simple because analytic is the following one. You have, you introduce a plasma parameter, which is just a gas to magnetic pressure, just so that you can distinguish jet from disk. And then you have an, a parameter, a coefficient that allows you to put more or less uh, emission at your wish. And, um, you know, as I said, playing with beta allows you to uh, enhance disk versus jet and playing with R high allows you to, to, uh, to change the contribution from the different parts. Now, you may think this is crude and, and, and it is crude, um, but I can also tell you that um, um, we have done much more refined uh, energy distributions, taking into account turbulent heating and magnetic reconnection, all of these fancy microphysical description. And when you compare uh, all of these fancy microphysical description with this very simple uh, recipe, you find out that actually they are indistinguishable to the precision of our, of our measurement. So crude, but works. Okay. then. We you know, you have to build a library. We've done a number of high resolution simulations, about half of them were done in Frankfurt. Uh, out of these scenarios, so one, um, out, of, out of the simulation, you can build scenarios by just playing around with the temperature distribution. And we built 400 scenarios. And each scenario is a, a wave of, um, you know, simulations over a long time scale, each of which will give you a snapshot. And you can see this is just an example of all the possible library that we built according to how you put the mass and the spin you can, and, and the uh, energy distribution you can have, you know, uh, very small shadows, very large shadows. And, and all of this, of course, changes with inclination. So a question I hope no one will ever ask me and, and actually so that I, I, no one asks me, I will already answer it is where do a millimeter uh, photons actually originate? The answer is we don't really know for sure, um, sorry. Um, because um, this information is very degenerate. Let me give you an example. This is a SANE simulation. 
This is the event horizon. This is the ISCO, the position of the ISCO. This is the photon of the, the photon region. So this is the envelope of all the photon rings in Kerr. And for the same simulation, exactly the same plasma dynamics, by just playing with this parameter, how high, I can have that most of the light comes from the disk or from the jet. And this is true, less severe, but also for a MED simulation. According to this parameter, I can, I can amplify the emission from the jet uh, or from the disk. And as you can see, um, the jet in a MED is actually much broader and um, than a jet in a sane, and that's because the magnetic field is larger, and, and so the whole jet becomes with a, a smaller pitch angle. Now, this brings me to the following consideration. Um, if I have an image, even a theoretical image like this one, these are four different cases. This is mad with two different R high, and this is sane with two different R high. And you ask me, where, which part of is contributing to this image? This is very hard for me to disentangle. I can do this because I have built these images theoretically, so I can decompose them. I can actually uh, just take them into the part coming from the mid plane, the disc, or the, come, the part coming from the near part of the jet, or even the part coming from the uh, receding jet. Now you may think this is strange, but even the receding jet, given the certain condition, can actually provide you with, with light. And as you can see, depending on how you play with your parameters, you can have that most of the light comes from the disk and you can forget about a jet, or that most of the light actually comes from the jet and even from the receding jet. So what we have is an image and that's it. We disentangling where the light comes from is far more complex than you may think. Okay, in this way, we built 60,000 images and then we had to, uh, find the best match. Um, for this, we use genetic algorithms or Markov chain called Monte Carlo pipelines. Again, we had to you know, come up with some reasonable way of doing this that uh, was not done before. And here is an example. So if you remember the Fourier space in the visibility uh, plane allows you to get two quantities, real and imaginary. Uh, and these are called the visibility amplitude and, and, and the closure phases. And the data is given by these blue dots. And, and you take a simulation, a synthetic simulation, a given snapshot, you the blur it to keep into account you know, sensitivity of the instruments. And you will get a certain chi-squared uh, with the image um, that you have as the reference. And you do this process uh, many, many times, actually 60,000 times or more. And then you build a distribution of chi-squared which allows you to make a comparison with the images. Um, and, and, you know, and you get situation like this. This is left is observations, right is theoretical models. And when you get something like this, you, are, you feel you're very happy because you know, the theoretical model, you know everything about it. And the good match makes you think you are, know everything about the observations. Unfortunately, this happens way too often. Um, so let me give you an example of what I mean. These are three different images which have the same chi-square. So, you know, uh, face value, they give you the same quality of match with the observations, but they correspond to completely different black holes. This is a, a curve counter-rotating. This is a curve co-rotating. This is... There is a way in which you can push the spin. And so we are essentially, essentially I'm afraid I think there is some uh, line problem because uh, I've seen Luciano frozen at the moment. Yes. Luciano, can you hear me?
Mm -hmm. Okay, see, I can hear you. Uh, because we see your image frozen and uh, your, uh, yeah, your can voice you now we can hear you again, but it's not well defined the voice. Uh, so it looks like, well, I guess that is, is trying to reconnect. Let's see. Let's give him uh, a minute to see if he can reconnect. Here he is. Luciano, can you hear me? Nope. Hi, Luciano. Now we can see you. Your image is still frozen. I don't know if you can hear me fine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, but it looks like there is some problem on your side with the speed of the internet because um, your voice is not completely fluid. Now it looks like it's going better because I see you moving. Try to speak, okay. please. Yeah, sorry. Um... I don't know. The I, I've just switched to my cell phone, hoping that this will do. Yes, let me, apparently it does. Uh, let me go back to where I was. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, oh. By the way, we had reached the thirty minutes, but I guess that uh, we can uh, in the past two minutes of the interruption. So just to because you asked me to let you know, but uh, very good. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I, I I don't know if you. Um, we got to this place that essentially we're not sensitive to spin and that's not a measurement we have reported. So um, in a way, this is good uh, because we know that the, the conclusions we have drawn that is that there is uh, a black hole is robust, but it's bad obviously because we are suffering from this degeneracy. Now, um, in, the, in the remaining five minutes or so, um, I want to tell you something about um, you know, what we've seen is consistent with the curved black hole in general relativity. We should never forget we are using observations. So astrophysics is an observational science. There is no way we can remove the fact that there are going to be the generative explanations. We're not doing an experiment. We're just observing. So if you want to start testing theory of gravity, this is not trivial um, because you have hundreds of alternatives and you can either have an agnostic approach or agnostic approach um, where you try to exclude and allow alternatives. I don't think there is, uh, just like for gravitational waves, there is no other way of doing this than convincing yourself that what you have is the most reasonable and simple explanation. So in the agnostic approach, uh, this is something I worked on. Uh, what you would like to do is um, exploit the fact that all you need for this game is a metric because you don't need to solve Einstein's equations. Um, you can use the equivalence principle. You can use the fact that all you're doing here is testing geodesics or matter dynamics in fixed space times. And so you need a metric. And um, what we have come up with is a metric um, plus some coefficients um, such that these coefficients are set to zero if you uh, want to look at a GR. And so in this way, you can describe any black hole space time you wish. These are the RZ and KRZ metrics uh, because they've been developed together with uh, Alexander Zidenko and Roman Konoplia. So there are two tricks that allow us to play this game uh, effectively. And the first one is that we used um, spatial comp compactification. So normally people who have done this in other uh, scenarios have used radial coordinates. We don't do that. We use a compactified uh, spatial coordinate. And rather than having a Taylor series in M over R, which is the standard and simplest approach to this, we use a Padet uh, expansion at the horizon in terms of a continued fraction. 
This allows you to have a very neat truncation because if you set one of the coefficients to zero, say a three, you immediately have all the others and others being set to zero. And because you are using a, this expansion, you are very powerful in capturing the diverging nature of metric functions near the horizon. And so with few coefficients, you are essentially, you can reproduce any metric you wish. The other approach is essentially look at some black hole, uh, the one you have chosen out of your shelf and test it. Use the same machinery you've used so far for Kerr and see what are the differences. And you can use, you know, maybe not necessarily horizon, uh, object with horizon, but horizonless and maybe boson stars, or you can start looking at, you know, uh, a zoology of black holes with charges, where charges are not the electric charge, are just whatever hair you can think of. Um, okay, first of all, when you compare black holes with different theories, you have to make sure that at least one property is the same. And, and you know, uh, we consider the atom black hole compared with Kerr, and we could either the data on black hole was used was non spinning. So, by using just one parameter, you could set either the horizon or the photon orbit or the e score to be the same as the one in Kerr. And then you, you perform simulations. As I was explaining, you have a, you know, a Kerr black hole on the left, you have a dilaton black hole on the right. Uh, the, the horizon sizes are different because these are matched at the same e score. And you look at this type of simulations and you convince yourself, yeah, well, they are different. However, you know, we're not going to have simulations giving us data. We're going to have just images. And, and, and this is what uh, we would see. So um, an image of a curved black hole and a dilaton black hole, they are different. Um, however, if you start doing this game for Sagittarius A star, where there is uh, some scattering variability, you would get something that looks more like so. And again, if you ask yourself, are they the same? You, you, you convince they are not the same, but they are very similar. And um, the bottom line is that you cannot distinguish black holes with the present ability or the present um, resolution. This is not the end of the story, uh, but when it comes down to black holes, distinguishing black holes in different theories is far more complex. And you can think of doing this with a, a boson star, okay? Boson stars are, very neat objects, um, they're very compact, uh, provide natural explanation uh, for dark matter. And, you know, for a phys theoretical physics that's got a scalar fill, uh, we, we, something we, we all always put in. So we have considered what happens to matter uh, and the same torus I was showing you before, if it is accreting now onto a, a boson star. And what you see is something very peculiar that tells you that there is a fundamentally different behavior of matter. Maybe you could have guessed this from the beginning, but boson stars do not have a surface. So matter can go in right very close to the center. Can't go to the center because as it gets in, there's going to be an eccentrifugal potential that develops. Um, but you can go and produce a torus, an accreting torus very close to the center. And so the shadow, although even if the, the boson star doesn't have a photon orbit, you will have a shadow because it's going to be a region not emitting but this emission, uh, not emitting region, will have very precise size. So this is an example of the imaging of a Kerr black hole and a boson star with the same mass. And you can see that, you know, they are very different. If you compare them um, through scattering and, and, and all, you see that they are different and the size of the, of the, of the shadow. In this case, it's not a shadow uh, because it was actually a they didn't have a photon ring, but it's just, you know, the dark region at the center is much smaller than what you would expect for a black hole of that mass. So the bottom line is that images, from images alone, it is possible to distinguish boson stars from black holes, at least for the model we have considered. So uh, I'll come up to my conclusions. Um, this project and this European project, Black Hole Cam, has provided input to all the aspects. We've studied accretion on two black holes to a level that was never done before. And we learned a number of things. And we're starting to do um, more extensive modeling, not only on curved black holes, but also on, on other black holes. And, and what we learned so far is that boson stars can be distinguished, and others uh, black holes cannot yet. If you ask me what is that the HD has done uh, for the scientific community? Well, one thing is that we have shown that uh, supermassive black holes and exists at the center of massive galaxies. Uh, you may say this was obvious, or you have already learned this in astronomy. There was a conjecture, now we know for sure. And 
Um, of course, we don't need for one galaxy, but for extension, you may think this is true for all the galaxies. But personally, I think what we've done is we change the rules of the game. We are now able to actually do some tests on horizon scale physics. And this is something that, you know, is making horizon physics testable is the first step of the scientific method. And so I think this is maybe the most important contribution of the ESD. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luciano, for a very, very nice talk. Um, we have uh, uh, a question, and probably we have time for just one question. Uh, there will be a discussion time anyway. So I will uh, now allow to talk to Il Sang Yon, uh, which had a question for you. Please, you can talk. Hello. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just basically just the question whether the observation like the polarizations or sort of the longer term monitoring of a, the black hole image itself will be useful to disentangle the degeneracy between different models from the simulations. Oh yeah, you bet. You can bet on it. Uh, the, you know, the advantage of, of, of doing black hole imaging is that the black hole are there um, and they will stay for quite some time. So you can repeat the, 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 uh, the observation, you can uh, try different techniques um, and polarization will tell you a lot about, uh, for instance, the, the, the topology of the magnetic fields. Um, we have uh, published um, a paper on the polarization of M87, which hints to the fact that we have a strong poloidal magnetic component, which is what you would expect if you have a jet and is giving more credit to um, the idea that you have a mad type of accretion rather than a chain, because it's telling you that magnetic field is, is really strong and so in, dynamically important. So yes, we want to disentangle and, 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 and remove this degeneracy. Also, I should mention this, maybe I wasn't clear enough. The degeneracy is severe if you use the image only, but if you start putting in other knowledge other priors for instance you know what is the uh, the power in the jet you know what is the x-ray luminosity things we haven't measured but have been measured by others then you can remove a large fraction of the models so in particular you can convince yourself that cannot be a Schwarzschild black hole it has to be a rotating black hole because all of the Schwarzschild black holes we have simulated do not produce a sufficiently powerful jet to match with the observations. So the degeneracy, is, as I said, is bad if you just stick to, to, to the image, but if you put in all the astrophysics we know, then things get much more uh, promising. Okay, thanks, Luciano. I think that there is another question, but it's a more general question about jets that probably is worth discussing in the discussion. Um, okay. So uh, just to stay on time, I think that is better now to, to pass